interpreted, in fact. And I think that this has become a real question for a lot of women who are saying to us, you know, maybe it is too hard. They're looking around and seeing, especially women who are approaching 40 or in the neighborhood of that age, saying, it looks to me like all of the men I know in my situation are finding women to partner with, and I'm not. Right. And this is what my experience is showing me. And we can talk round and round about feelings, but we also need to talk about the real set of factors that do weigh in when you are trying to decide whether to make a life or, you know, attempt a life with somebody or not. So we're going to call on the big guns. We've got an actual economist is going to be on Dear Sugar Radio. Paul Oyer. Yes. I remember in 2008, Remember, Lori Gottlieb wrote this essay called Marry Him, The Case for Settling for Mr. Good Enough. Mm -hmm. It caused such a really a a great conversation among all of the women I know. And it turned into a book that she published a bit later. And she made the case really for settling Mm -hmm. on these grounds that, you know, these anxieties are real, that if you stay to those high standards, that you will miss the opportunity to have a partner, at least if you're a straight woman, that in fact... It's not that there's a dearth of men, but that too many women expect too much from their male partners. So I'm really curious about how Paul Oyer is going to weigh in on this. Mm -hmm. But before we speak to the expert, let's hear a letter from a woman in the field. Dear Sugars, I want to ask you about scarcity. At 34 years old, I'm still trying to find someone to settle down with. My last serious relationship was seven years ago. Right now, I'm watching countless numbers of people around me date, court, commit, marry, have children, etc. I have a full life. I have a good job, a fantastic network of friends. I'm active and sporty. I'm constantly working on creative projects and developing new hobbies. Since my last relationship, I've had a series of short-term relationships and flings. I've tried to find a long-term partner, but things do not work out. I've met people online and through friends and in random encounters but nothing has stuck long-term. Lately, I've been plagued with regrets, rueful that maybe I should have tried harder with men or compromised more or not left a relationship so hastily, stayed and attempted to work things out. I can't shake this idea of scarcity. The city I live in is by no means small, but once you subtract factors such as age, values, interests, availability, politics, and attraction, the pool shrinks significantly. I don't like that this fear of scarcity is driving me to feelings of regret. I know people find love at all ages, but I'm currently surrounded by couples who are planning the rest of their lives together. I date, but I find that I keep meeting people who have serious issues. Alcoholics, manipulative cheaters, men who hold steadfast misogynistic or sexist views that clash with my values. I can't quite shake this idea that, quote, all the good ones are taken. I wonder, is scarcity a real thing? Is it a matter of coming to terms with reality and acceptance of my life as a single person? Or do I have to be more driven when it comes to dating or less compromising and just stay with someone who is good enough? Signed, Scared of Scarcity. Mm -hmm. So, Cheryl, that letter, in fact, is maybe the Ur text to a whole bunch of letters where it's not so much about anxiety about should I be married, should I settle, and much more what is actually available to me in this same fear of scarcity. So, for instance, we got a letter from a woman who identifies herself as wary. She's 31 years old, and she writes in part, it feels like all of the emotionally available men are already spoken for, like a window closed on the opportunity to find a life partner without me even realizing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Central Sadness, who's 37, writes, Now that I'm getting older, I get fewer dates, and the men seem to have multiple great women to choose from. We hear this over and over and over again. It's not like there isn't a demographic element to this and a gender element to this. We hear from so many women that it's not just I'm feeling anxious. It's men are in a different circumstance, and women have fewer options, fewer to choose from. And how long should I wait is another question. We have a letter from... A 36-year-old who calls herself the lonely Buddhist fly fisherman. I love that. I would date her just based on that signature. I think it sounds pretty great. She says, I'm starting to feel nervous as I near my 37th birthday that things may not come into place. I see the pool of available men dwindle each passing year. And all I need is one, my one. How long should I wait? Mm -hmm. Am I being too picky or unrealistic? Should I simply suck it up and start a life with a good guy I'm not in love with? Should I accept a disheartened future of spinsterhood? I think a lot of women 
in their late 30s and early 40s are asking that, especially if they want to have biological children, because, of course, that is a huge factor for a lot of these women. They need, if they are straight and they want to have that traditional partnership, they need a man to do it. Right. And men are on a different clock. Because we're on a different clock, women are dragged along on that clock. You know, I basically have the option to wait around. And that Mm -hmm. means I can make whoever it is who might be interested in getting married to me and having kids with me wait around. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about the question at the heart of Scared of Scarcity's Letter and and the question that Lori Gottlieb's essay and then book addressed, which is, you know, she's saying she's full of regret, that maybe she should have tried harder, not left relationships that didn't, you know, fully fulfill her expectations. Right. I will say my instinct, and, and I read Gottlieb's piece when it came out in The Atlantic and then really hungrily sort of devoured the debate around it. And I never quite came down on either side. But I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a sort of optimistic and dreamy enough person that I'm like, no, mm-hmm. never settled. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I've been with my husband now 20 years. Right. We've been married 16 of them. I also know that a long-term monogamy is about accepting a lot of things that maybe aren't ideal. Exactly. And that's where I think this language of settling is really insulting, and mm -hmm. I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. You're going to settle. Right. (laughs) Once you settle down, that's the reality is you are going to have to settle with somebody and all of their pathologies and all their neuroses and all the stuff they keep in their hidey holes that you are only going to have access to because if it's a good, healthy marriage, you're going to see all of them, Mm -hmm. right? And I know that sounds like a bleak prospectus and it's not romantic, but it's also what I really know to be true of long-term relationships. None of them are perfect. They all are full of compromises and the feeling of, quote, unquote, settling. Yeah. Well, and I don't think that Scared of Scarcity is saying that she had particularly high expectations. But maybe the bit of advice I can give you, Scared of Scarcity, is, you know, first of all, those regrets aren't serving you. But Reflecting upon those previous relationships yes. and thinking about what you can learn from them and take into that next relationship that I know you're going to have. Maybe you did break up too hastily with some of those exes, right? Maybe you did have a sort of ideal that you've come to through your maturing process, realize was maybe not exactly going to serve you in the end. Mm-hmm. Here's where I really have a difference when it comes to this idea of settling. I do not think that you should join in a partnership, a long-term partnership, Mm -hmm. with somebody you don't essentially love and admire, with somebody who doesn't make you feel like you want to be the best version of yourself that you can be. Mm -hmm. I I think that that's, to me, an essential. And then beyond that, as you say, there are all of these compromises we must make, and relationships aren't these sort of boxes you have to check every one. But I think what Scared of Scarcity is asking us here is, you know, okay, you know, I surrender. I'm willing to sort of uh, cast the the net wide here in Mm -hmm. terms of finding a partner. And how do I do it now that it seems like all of this uh, opportunity has dried up? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I'm not sure where she is on, on that spectrum. I mean, she's saying the city I live in is by no means small, but once you subtract factors such as age, values, interest, availability, politics, and attraction... And so my question is, well, should you be subtracting all of those factors or should you do a self-inventory that says Mm -hmm. it's important to me that this person is thus and such an age range, that they're available to me? And for me, because of who I am, politics are important to me. And so that's about I mean, this is what we do when we're making any kind of big, important Mm -hmm. decision is we try to do a self-inventory in which we're brutally honest with ourselves about what's absolutely necessary. And what's more, we would like it. It's discretionary. Mm -hmm. You know, I had all sorts of ideas in my head because of how I was raised, the family I was raised in, that I would get involved with a doctor because my mom was a doctor. (laughs) We kind of don't recognize our own dogma, the boxes that we, you Mm -hmm. know, have, have been established in our minds, not really by us, but to us in a way. And so I had this idea that I have to have this high achieving, badass kind of type A partner. And I remember going on blind dates with women who checked that box. But Cheryl, I just, it was bullshit. Mm -hmm. That's what I told myself I wanted out of my own ego or whatever it was. And the reality is I wanted somebody who was compassionate 
and patient and understood my artistic desires and had ones of their own. Those were the boxes that were more important Mm -hmm. to me. But for years, I carried around this idea, and I think it was a certain... I don't know, I guess a feeling that I needed somebody who was so strong that she would take care of the mess that I am. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is I had to spend about a decade trying to figure out how to take care of that mess myself and get with somebody who really deep down shared a lot of my doubts and fears and anxieties but was able to to keep me company in them, Mm. right? Now, that doesn't sound like a sound a plan, but it's actually who I was. So then that's the best plan. So that's the question for you, scared of scarcity. Who are you? Mm -hmm. And what is absolutely essential to your happiness with a partner? And you have to, without beating yourself up and getting lost in a sort of spiral of regret, figure out what is essential and look at some of those previous relationships and see if they are trying to teach you that maybe you were too dismissive. Mm -hmm. Not of a particular person, but maybe of a moment in a relationship where things weren't going well enough, as they clearly have in the rest of your life, where you're amassing friends and pursuing your career. And the thing is that lots of stuff's tough in life, but making it with one person in an enduring way that's nourishing to you, I think that's the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. And it's different than the kind of advancement that you can make academically and intellectually and professionally and even socially with friends. I'm not saying those things are easy, but it's a different set of skills and a different capacity to compromise that is required of you. And that's why, for me anyway, I was bailing out or backing out of a lot of relationships because they simply became too difficult and inconvenient. And I did do the same thing that you did, Scared of Scarcity. I I backed out of relationships hastily. And this may sound crazy to say, but I believe that I probably could have gotten married to my high school girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Honestly, if I'd had my act more together, I think she's somebody who is exceptional and special. And we really connected. We were both just too young. And I can point to other people in my relationship history where if I was at a different place, we would have absolutely made a happy life. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that idea of there's one person out there waiting for you. I think there are a a whole range of people, and you have to be in the right moment, and you have to find somebody else who's in the right moment. Then you have to just do the work. Right. And I remember one of our earliest episodes was a a letter. Do you remember this letter from somebody who was a a woman who was like, I love my boyfriend, but, you know, he just isn't ambitious enough for me or we're not matched in this way, Mm -hmm. which, you know, she was asking a different kind of question. But, you know, there she was in love with somebody who wasn't that, like you say, you had this idea you were going to marry a doctor and Aaron is not that. And and sometimes that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it can be a revelation. Like you realize that actually the partner you thought you were looking for, that person in real life looks very different. Right. And so I do want to say scared of scarcity that maybe sort of shake things up a bit. Also, you are only 34, which sounds very like, oh, don't worry. I totally understand why you're worried at age 34. I do. Especially if becoming a biological mother is a hope for you. But it's also true that there are so many women who at 34 have this fear and this sense of like, I'm never going to meet anyone. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, at 37, they're walking down the aisle with the the partner of their dreams, Mm -hmm. you know. So I do want to also put that into perspective. Another thing to think about, you know, I mentioned earlier about this idea of like not regretting the past and those past relationships and those decisions you made, using them, them. learning from them, but also sometimes circling back to them. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of relationships that were were born at an earlier point that you circle back and you say, okay, we broke up, you know, 10 years ago for these reasons. Well, now I'm a different person. Who are you? Of course, that person could be married to somebody else. But but sometimes it's important to reconnect with those past people. I'll tell you, there are a couple of things in this letter that gave me pause Mm -hmm. and that are really just ones for you to sit with and think about scared of scarcity. And this is why writing a letter and putting it sort of in black and white can be illuminating. My last serious relationship was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And also the men I'm meeting are alcoholics, manipulative cheaters, men who are misogynistic. I see this so frequently, Cheryl, when I have so many friends who were in this situation or are in this situation. And I see this same weird disjunction in operation. I think it's worth asking when so many of the parts of your life are going so well, 
what deep down is holding you back from even being in a serious relationship for seven years? Because that's a significant period of time. She's saying since the time I was 27, Mm -hmm. I haven't been in a serious relationship. And there's nothing wrong with that except that it's clearly something that has started to weigh on you, make you question your decisions and, you know, why you're making them. And you should listen to that. You're asking about a question that has to do with scarcity, and we will talk with Paul Oyer, who can speak to some of that very realistic in just a sec. But right. before we get to him, I think we would both agree, Cheryl, you should listen to the fact that it's not just the scarcity, but how frightened you are about it that is part of this. You know, everything in your life is zooming along wonderfully, but there's this one area where you sound to me like you feel trapped and full of regret and quite confused. Mm-hmm. As do the chorus of other Right. Women, we read uh, just a brief sampling of them. Right. You know, at the very least, scared of scarcity, you're not alone. And so let's call Paul Oyer and mm-hmm. see what he has to say. Uh, scared of scarcity asks this great question Is scarcity a real thing? I think that Professor Oyer will be able to help us. He's a professor at Stanford of economics, and he's spent a lot of time looking at all of these questions around dating and scarcity and romance and love in America. Everything I learned about economics I learned from online dating is the name of his book. Let's get him on the phone. Hello? Professor Oyer? Yeah. Hi, this is Cheryl Strayed. I'm here with Steve Almond. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us today to have this conversation. Sure. So we have just really an avalanche of letters from our listeners, all kinds of women from you know early 20s to mid-50s saying essentially the same thing. What is wrong with me? Why can't I find the one? Why can't I find that that man of my dreams or even a man good enough to, you know, hang out with for a few years and maybe have a couple of kids with? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we thought that you'd give us some insight into this question of you know, is scarcity a real thing? Is there really a sort of imbalance when it comes to, you know, are there more women looking for men than men looking for women? Mm-hmm. All right. So um, from a simple supply and demand point of view, women do have something to worry about and it gets much worse as they age. So I think early on when men and women are in their 20s, I think you often see that women have the power in the marketplace, as it were. Either there's more men or they're just more interested and desperate at that point in their lives. Horny. Yes. I think the word is horny. Yeah, I was going to circle around that word, but okay. yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's say they have a positive market inducement. How about that? <laughs> you know, I'm an economist. I don't... <laughs> yeah, he doesn't traffic in words like that, Cheryl. Okay. Keep it clean. Okay. I'm not averse to them. I'm just saying that's not, you know, part of my scientific... Uh... Right. You be the scientist and we'll add the dirty parts. <laughs> that's right. That's kind of our thing. <laughs> Now, that changes dramatically as women age. So I think that one thing that is potentially problematic for women is if they don't anticipate that well. So when you're in your 20s and there are just tons of men out there dying to go out with you, you know, it's possible as a woman you could begin to get a little bit um, used to that. Mm -hmm. And the numbers just change dramatically, you know, starting really at age 30. But once you've hit age 40, it's just pretty dramatic. Mm Mm-hmm. It mostly comes from one very simple fact, which is that men live shorter than women do. So if you look in the marketplace, how many 80-year-old men are there compared to 80-year-old women? It's just a dramatic difference. And that starts filtering down. So as a result, the 80-year-old men who are out there, there's a a shortage of them, and there's a shortage of 70-year-old men as well. So the 70-year-old women end up being willing to go with the 80-year-old men, and that effectively works all the way down the ladder to people in their 30s, at least, if not 20s. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you've just crushed countless women across America. But he didn't mean to crush. It's just data. <laughs> it's simple supply and demand. Right. Right. You know, but I think it's important to be crushed, if that's the right word, because you need to realize that and plan accordingly. So when you're in your 20s and the world is your oyster, if you're an attractive woman, you know, the men's time will come. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And for reasons that are not completely apparent, uh, cities differ very much on the male-female ratio. Mm -hmm. So as you get older, no matter what, men become scarcer. But in San Francisco, 
for example, men are less scarce. It's because of the engineering focus or whatever. I'm not exactly you know, sure what it is. But women are relatively scarce in San Francisco. Now, as they get older, that's not going to be as true. But New York and Washington, for reasons that are very unclear to me, are very female-dominated cities at all age groups. So women in New York and Washington are at a disadvantage to begin with. And then, of course, that just gets much worse with time. And part of the reason I'm just going to venture a, you know, purely totally spurious observation, but because so much of our media narrative comes out of New York, especially, I think it probably tends to amplify that sense, that desperate sense of, oh, you know, the pool is drying up and there aren't any good men available and women are in this should be in a state of panic. It's probably significant that so many of the narratives that we get about what's happening in the culture come out of this city, where it's true, just objectively, economically, that women have it tougher. Right. And that was, of course, worse when Sex in the City was on the air. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. I'm utterly fascinated by it. So you're talking about this as an economist, obviously, the numbers. So that beyond age 30, the numbers don't add up equally, yeah. but also the cultural stuff where it's also easier for an older man to date a younger woman. It's, there's more cultural approval, say, for a 45-year-old to be dating a 29-year-old if the 45-year-old is male rather than female, right? Well, so, you know, I'm not uh, a sociologist, but certainly casually, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I think the cultural norm that you're talking about was probably driven by the supply and demand as much as by anything else. Really? Well, I mean, it's hard to say because, of course, historically, men have had a more dominant position in the culture in general. So, you know, they could have what they want. I mean, one other thing that leads to this imbalance, maybe besides just the numbers, though, is preferences. And what I mean by that is, again, these are what I'm about to say are averages. They're not true for every man and woman, but the data are very clear about this. The thing men are looking for in a relationship is uh, attractive women. So, Cheryl, I know you're shocked by this. I hate men. I just, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love men, but you know. Okay, so they're looking for hot right. babes. Yeah, so I'm going to leave my economist, um, you know, elite terminology and say, Men want hot women. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. I could not bring myself to use the word babes. Okay. But. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do teach at Stanford. You, you have to have a certain standard there, right? right? So okay. that's number one. And that's just in the data. We can regret that. We can think that's shallow of them. But, you know, that's probably some sort of biological thing that was required in order for the species to have survived this long. So I'm not going to pass any judgment on that. I'm just going to tell you that's what the facts are. Okay. Well, by the same token, and again, I think this is a Darwinian outcome as much as anything else as well, even though I'm no biologist, but women are attracted to men with money. Wow. That was almost as depressing as the hot <laughs> babage thing, but okay, keep well, going. You can't, you can't be depressed by either of these things. These are human nature, right? So as right. an economist, we like to point out to the world, hey, people are selfish and they're greedy. And everybody's like, oh, that's so depressing. It's like, well, that's just the way it is. Right. You know, you can wish that the world was a different place than it is, but that's what men are looking for. Again, this is on average. There are a lot of men who are attracted to women with money or, you know, who are smart or something like that. And there are, by the same token, a lot of women attracted to men who are smart or good looking rather than those with money. I'm just right. telling you on average, these are true mm -hmm. facts. And those probably lead also to that social norm in the sense that for men, when do you get a lot of money? Well, it tends to be when you're older. So yeah. that might make younger women more open to older men. And by the same token, mm -hmm. once you're old and you have more money, you may be like, well, now I can sort of right. you know, get the hot woman I, I used to covet when I had no money. That's but right. now I'm getting a little outside my realm of knowledge. <laughs> right. But but it's fascinating because we think of, for instance, you know, the idea of the sugar daddy and we sort of we have whatever set of views we have about that, the, you know, how healthy and right those relationships are. But what you're trying to make clear is those are expressions of very clear, concrete data that we know about human nature. Even if on the surveys we try to clean it up and say, well, we're really interested in finding a soulmate. There are these truths that run beneath that, that are almost at sort of the level of biology or bioevolutionary, you know, thought and behavior that explain those patterns, right? But the demographic we're talking about, Professor Royer, is fascinatingly 
women who are, you know, I guess you would say, just looking at it objectively, scientifically, it, in a position of weakness relatively. They have less and less power in the marketplace of relationships because the woman we're specifically talking about, scared of scarcity, is 34 years old. Mm -hmm. She has not had a serious relationship, a serious relationship in the last seven years. And she says that she thinks about factors such as age, values, interests, availability, and politics. If you were just, again, objectively as an economist and a scientist who studied and thought about this, if you were talking with her about scarcity and how she might behave and think about marital prospects, what would you say? Well, I would say realism is very, very important here. So you can't hold out for the perfect man out there because, first of all, he doesn't exist. And second of all, if he did, somebody else might have found him by now instead. Yeah. There is no one, as they say. People like to think about, you know, I'm waiting for my soulmate. And a little catchphrase I like to use as an economist, I'm a labor economist. And labor economists, you know, among other things, some people won the Nobel Prize for pointing out that workers and firms that are too picky waiting for the exact perfect uh, match mm -hmm. is one of the contributing factors that leads to unemployment in society. And so it's literally the same exact logic. People who are searching for partners who are too picky end up uh, what I like to refer to as romantically unemployed. <laughs> so loneliness is just romantic unemployment, right. and it comes from being too picky. Now, that's fine. So women should be both sexes, but especially women should be more picky when they're younger. And the reason for that is it's costly and so forth to go keep looking for somebody who's better, as it were, a better match for you. I don't want to say better in the sense of, you know, a better person, but a better, what you're looking for isn't a better person, it's a better match for you. And when you're younger, you should go ahead and be picky about that because you have, you know, the relative to the amount of time you're going to spend with this person, Finding a good match, spending time finding a good match, you know, isn't that big a deal. Mm -hmm. If you're 40, when you find the right person, you have 50 years with that person. Right. When I went back in the market, I was about 50. And, you know, I couldn't be quite as picky because if I wasted a year looking for a person, that was, you know, not a trivial portion of the time I had left right. with whoever I ended up with. Now, that's more of an issue for women because of the supply-demand imbalance and how that changes over time for them. But yeah, I mean, it's the romantic notion of waiting for the one is what leads to loneliness or, you know, romantic unemployment or however you want to put it. Um, you know, the thing is, you should be very rational about thinking about these things this way. I like to think at least because at the end, you know, you can have regret when you're 40 or 50 or whatever for two types of reasons. One is you, you realize in retrospect that that person you broke up with because they had bad table manners was actually wonderful on so many other dimensions. And so, you know, trying to avoid that regret later on, and there's another type of regret, of course, which is you marry your high school sweetheart, and by the time you're 28, you realize, wow, there are a lot of people out there that would have been a better match for me. Mm -hmm. right. You know, but that's just the nature of, of relationships. And um, I think, again, if you look in the population, because of the supply-demand imbalance, you end up having a lot more women who regret not right. accepting a very good option when they were in their 20s and holding out for somebody better that never came along. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed, really, at your language and I, I, the marketplace and, you know, all of these terms that seem very unromantic. You are far from the first person <laughs> to accuse me of I, being unromantic. <laughs> I'm a starry-eyed romantic, but I'm really fascinated by what you have to say. And I think that dating has become in the modern age, we do put it on the marketplace online and these online dating sites. And I understand this has been an area of research for you. It's the subject of your book. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about how successful online dating is. Does it increase women's odds of finding a man? If And here we're talking specifically about uh, heterosexual partnerships here, yeah, right. this male-female dynamic. Obviously, I just want to shout out to our LGBT listeners that we don't mean to not be including you in this conversation. I think some of the issues apply across 
uh, gender identification and some don't, but but this sort of male-female dynamic. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this uh, online dating scene. Right. So just, you know, to reiterate what you said about the LBGT community, most of what we're talking about applies perfectly well there. With There's two things that don't quite apply. As you said, the demographic differences between men and women. Obviously, if you're looking at a same-sex relationship, that's not an issue. And the other thing is, I'll just say it as an aside, the LBGT community has a very different, so now I'm really going to be uh, the economist, has a very different competitive dynamic than the heterosexual world. Because in the heterosexual dating world, you know who's your competition and who's your target audience. Hmm. Uh-huh. And the LBGT community, there's no delineation there. You know, everybody who's your potential partner is also your potential competitor. So it changes the dynamic in that way in an interesting manner. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. Right. <laughs> I never quite thought of it that way. You're, you're all on the same team. Yeah, but you're all co- also competing. So anyway, but to back to your point, I think uh, online dating has certainly made dating in general and finding relationships easier and smoother for lots and lots of people. And I think it's probably leading, and there's not enough evidence to be 100% sure about this, but I think it's leading to longer and better relationships because it does what we call, and again, I'm being really analytical about this, it makes markets thicker. So when you were dating in the pre-online dating world, your opportunities were limited to who was at the singles bar, who was at your workplace, who was at wherever you would go to look. So when you're 20, that maybe doesn't make a difference. My children are in college. They don't need online dating. They're on college campuses, which are just big online dating sites. Right. (laughs) But when I was 50, you know, and there are in between, there's, there's less extreme versions. But when I was single and 50 and looking for somebody, where was I going to find that person? Right, right. And so the market for 50-year-old single people is very thick. It can be very thick on an online dating site. It's very thin almost everywhere else you go. Mm-hmm. And the, the way my relationship worked out is, is the best example of this, I think, possible. My girlfriend and I have many friends in common we worked 100 yards away from each other. We passed each other on the street, I'm sure, countless times without ever knowing about it. Huh. And you and never yet, looked twice at this hot babe? We had never met. <laughs> yeah, you're this like a hugely rich Stanford economist. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you're overestimating book sales. <laughs> but, you know, we met each other on a dating site. And it's been wonderful. If somebody had set us up, maybe it would have worked just as well. But Mm -hmm. this was a much lower cost way of screening each other until we got to the right people. Now, I'm optimistic, hopelessly optimistic that dating sites, which have already done, I think, a lot for the world, are going to get better over time in two dimensions. One is, and, you know, predicting the future like this is always I mean, they're probably going to get better for reasons I'm not predicting, to be honest. That's the way these things always work in reality. But my best guess or my biggest hope for how online dating sites can get even better is two things. One is they're just generating all this data about who likes who and who's interested in who and so forth. And I'm hoping that the algorithms they use to match people will get better and better. So we want this thick market I mentioned where there are millions of other people on the site. And what would make this even better is if they get better at saying, we have millions of people on our site, but here's the 20 that we think are really good matches for you. Mm -hmm. And they do that to some degree now, but there's a lot of, I'm hoping the noise in that process will get lower. Hmm. Second way I'm hoping the dating sites will get better is by, um, and I think women find this more of a problem than men, is figuring out ways to verify information at a reasonable cost. Right. As you know, there's so much exaggeration and lying on websites, which is completely rational. It's exactly what we'd expect. But if we can verify that, it's going to be great. Not, and the reason for that isn't because it's going to weed out the liars, although that's actually a big part of it. It's going to be that the people who don't lie and are on the sites just to really find relationships rather than just to find somebody to hook up with for casual relationships or sex or something like that. Those people, if you're more honest on your profile, if all the other people out there who are lying go away, 
that's going to help you find the right person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But have these online dating sites actually decreased the number of people who are single and unhappy about it? That's a good question. It's very hard to say that. I have not seen a good way of studying whether we actually have fewer lonely people now than we used to have. Right. So by what I said before, especially with somebody who's older through online dating, we should have lower levels of loneliness or unattachment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we do have that now. That's a very good point. Well, Professor, or I think you've answered a couple of questions in this letter unequivocally. She writes, you know, is scarcity a real thing? And you're saying, yes, actually it is. And she also says it seems as if the dating pool is drying up at this age. She's 34. And your response would be, again, nothing personal, but looking at the numbers, that perception is real. That is a real thing. The question that she then asks is the one that I'm interested in getting your answer to. She says, you know, should I come to terms with the reality and acceptance of my life as a single person? I don't expect you to address that, but this part of it. Or do I have to be more driven when it comes to dating? or less compromising and just stay with someone who is good enough. Again, I, we know you're not a relationship advisor, but purely from the lens of economics, what do you say to that? Should she be more driven when it comes to dating? And if so, what form does that take? Can I take one second and go get my book? Because I, I would yes. love to read a quote from it. You, I... yes. yes, you may. Totally fascinating. I yes. love scientists. Right. <laughs> Right. They know everything. And then I realized we know nothing. Right. Correct. Um, the advice I would give to this person on both of those questions is yes. That is, be more driven. You have to be in the market to succeed in the market. So you have to put yourself out there. And for me, that was very hard. I'm sort of relatively shy and at least with people I don't know. And I hadn't been uh, dating in 20 years. And, you know, I just had to put myself out there. And well, a lot of women like a shy professor. Oh, my God. <laughs> the flirt. So on the second point, you know, what? how did she put it in the letter? Do I have to settle? Uh, she says, or do I uh, have to be more driven when it comes to dating or less compromising and just stay with someone who is good enough? Right. And, you know, when you put it that way, it sounds so depressing. But if you approach it in the following way and you say, I have to keep searching until I find someone who is great or really good. I don't have to keep searching until I find the one right. or the perfect person. When you put it that way, then it's a, it sounds a little less sad. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes. So as I wrote in my book, uh, excuse me for quoting myself, I said, at some point you will say to yourself, though I recommend you do not say this out loud, my partner is truly wonderful. If I kept looking, I could probably do better. But I have to earn a living, make dinner, practice the piano, and do a bunch of other stuff. So I'm going to settle for this person and move on with my life. It could certainly be a lot worse. Now, saying that to yourself sounds terrible. But if you just say that with slightly more positive words in a couple of places, it sounds great. It's like, hey, this is my partner. I'm going to go forward you know, with this person now and make a life. Right. Wow. And you got to do that at a certain point because, you know, otherwise you're going to look back and regret it. Right. So that's the economist take on this. There's a social psychology take on it, which is very similar. I was, I'll give a shout out to somebody who else who wrote a book who you may have spoken to, or if you haven't, you might consider calling her for a future show. Mm -hmm. Lori Gottlieb. Uh -huh, right. Yes. We were just discussing her and her book, actually. And she wrote the book, Marry Him, The Case yeah. for Settling for Mr. Good Enough. And it sounds to me that you agree with her point. Right. So so I completely agree with her point. Um, well, she sort of says this is a big problem. Women are are unrealistic and they regret it later. And they're, you know, on an anecdotal basis, we know that's that's just she's absolutely right. I don't want to make the systematic point you know, that this is a real problem for most women or something. I'm not sure if we can make that case, but I've spoken to her and we come at this from very different approaches, but we see completely eye to eye on this. She would never say when you're picking your partner, you have to do optimal cost benefit analysis. But in her own language, she's saying that. Sure. So I'm going to use a term that I don't think is an economics term, but maybe it is. It's this idea of buyer's remorse. 
Mm-hmm. And I think the, an undercurrent, right, Cheryl, of what we're hearing in a lot of these letters are, if I do settle with somebody who's just good enough, later on I'm going to feel regret. There's somebody who's you know, better who's out there. Um, what is your response to that? Again, through the lens of economics, that idea of, well, if I settle for somebody, I will live with this regret that I didn't choose the best person for me. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you feel like settling for somebody and, and you're not going to be able to get over it in the way you just said and you're going to regret it, then my advice would be don't settle because you're going to be unhappy. You're going to be unhappy either way, but you're missing out on the possibility of doing better. Also, I think settling for somebody and regretting it later on is as unfair to the other person as it is to yourself anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. But it's kind of a thought experiment that is – You know, you can say, well, I regret that I didn't find somebody else, but that's not tested by reality. That's tested by a self-punishing version of, well, there was somebody better out there. And what we're hearing and what you're suggesting, again, taking all the romance out of it and just looking at the data is there is nothing to say that there is a better person out there. That's just something you can use to torture yourself when you're feeling frustrated with the person you're with. I agree with that completely. You said it very nicely. Well, and to think about all those people who thought they had chosen the perfect one and then realized they didn't. Divorce rates pair up on that. Right. <laughs> Professor Oyer, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. No problem. Good luck with your girlfriend. I, my recommendation is to keep her. Yes. Right. Well, anybody who's read that book and is willing to stay with me, I'm, you know, really. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, really charming. You, you crazy romantic. <laughs> I hope that when you're, you know, in your more romantic moments, that you forget some of this number shit and you just I like. Do. I do. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank bye. you guys. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR in the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Scene Now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from the New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. Honestly, whenever I talk to a scientist, I'm both utterly enthralled and I think, this is the key to life. This is the key to life. And then I, on the other hand, I'm like, oh, this is terrible. It's destroying everything I want to believe about the world. I'm very excited about his ideas. And I think, as with anything, and he would say this too, you know, like he said, you know, these are what the statistics show us. Right. And yet there are always exceptions to those numbers. Yeah. And this is the sort of the rational part of us. And then there's this irrational, and I don't want to say romantic as always being irrational, but usually it is. And that's kind of tough medicine. What he had to say was tough to hear because it's a confirmation of these anxieties we heard last week and, you know, are talking about again this week and the confirmation that it is actually true. Scarcity is a real thing. And it's like super depressing to face that, but it also gives you an honest view of things. Right. And I also want to point out that you know, there's there's settling and then there's really settling. And it, I, by no stretch of the imagination think that being in a relationship that is miserable and unhappy and destructive yep. and, you know, is better than being single and needing to work harder than maybe a coupled person would need to work to feel fulfilled in life. And there are so many amazingly vibrant single people out there who are looking for love and managing to have really cool lives in the course of that, okay? And they would like to find that partner, but they're not waiting around 
letting that longing get in the way of all of the, the great things that are happening in their lives. Yes. People don't have to couple off. They don't have to have kids. They don't have to do any of that stuff. But you can hear in this letter that it's starting to eat away at her. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense that she's missing out on a certain experience. And she has an intuition that it might not just be that it's the world's problem, that there's something in her that maybe is setting up a false dichotomy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm either going to have to settle for somebody or I'm going to have to be single. And it's like we're all settling for somebody. I think what a, the part of it that, that feels uncomfortable for me, and I think that, that some of our listeners will recoil at this too, yep. because women have been objectified so much by the culture and by the male gaze. And so this idea of us as our very bodies as sort of products on this marketplace mm -hmm. is a little bit hard to uh, accept. Yep. I understand that Professor Oyer is speaking in, in these, these different economic terms. I think that's important to note that you don't have to be on the marketplace unless you want to be. So I, I would say to all the single women out there and, and the single men too who are looking for love, we really are speaking to that very particular group of you who who really want to find that partner. Right. And so by saying, oh, put yourself on the marketplace, it sounds almost offensive. What we really mean is go out there and get what you want. In a way, Cheryl, it's disheartening, but there's also this sense that we are stuck between two um, it's not a false binary, but there are these real anxieties that we're trying to sort out, right? Lena was trying to help us sort out this larger anxiety of why, how does this idea of the one take root inside of us? And how much is it a real thing that we should be worried about? And how much is it a kind of cultural construct? And it's keeping us from understanding what we really desire. Mm -hmm. And then there's Paul Oyer on the other side saying, well, listen, actually, if you really do want to settle down, if that's something that you feel intuitively... If you are moving into your 30s, especially late 30s, early 40s, there's real data to suggest that it's going to be much harder for you to find that particular path to happiness. But then the question becomes, actually, should those be the only two things we're talking about? No. And I think that we would be doing our listeners a disservice if we stopped the inquiry into this question right here. Right. I, I really feel haunted by the place we're at right now. I feel like we haven't really addressed in a deep and illuminating way these questions that have been asked by so many women yeah. about finding the one and being alone and being partnered and married. And so one thing that Lena mentioned in our conversation is this really interesting essay that Kate Bullock wrote in Atlantic Monthly right. called All the Single Ladies. Mm -hmm. And from that essay was born her book, Spinster. And I think that she would be a really insightful person to talk to. Uh, and that's what we're going to do next week, to talk about what about life on your own? What about being a spinster? We've seen that word throughout time as a right. negative thing. But I think the deeper question when we address this, how do I find the one, is how do you feel whole within yourself? Right. You know, one of the things I want to say to these letter writers is we're not trying to say, hey, let that dream go. Right. It's perfectly legitimate to say, I want a partner and to do everything you can in your life to find that partner. But I do think that it is it's, it's sort of a truth of whenever you have a struggle, whenever you want something, you always have to first go back to that self right. and ask yourself really deeply, how can I make myself whole so I can pursue that thing I want without that theory of scarcity ruling me? Right. As we know, and this is something I said over and over in my Dear Sugar columns, is we can almost attain nothing out of a sense of scarcity. We have to come at our work and our love and our lives from a feeling of abundance. That's and right. so what I feel is missing, and what this is why I suggested this part three we're going to do, is how do we find that sense of abundance regardless of what we're looking for, right. whether we're looking to end a relationship or find a relationship or remain single all of right. our lives? Right. How do we find that sense of abundance? And to the letter writers, that's what I'm hoping yeah. we're going to help you grapple with next week. Fantastic. Because it is terrible to try to pursue something you desperately want out of fear and anxiety. It never works. It never works. And so I propose next week that you all come back. All right. For part three of One is the Loneliest Number, this question of 